Now, um, first of all, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending tonight. I appreciate and just want to acknowledge that. Thank you so much. I know that this was scheduled a few weeks ago, but I had some health issues. And I just want to thank you for being on here tonight. This has been, um, honestly, a reality check for me when it comes to dental sealants. Tonight, what I'm going to share with you is just some of the things that I have learned really firsthand and uh, and and really put this course together um, because of my daughter, Haley, and uh, who is a dental assistant. And uh, um, Haley's about 25 years old. And I can tell you that I was the person that placed her sealants on her first molars. And uh, about two years ago, she had been telling me that this one tooth had been hurting, tooth number 30. And, uh, and so just came in, we took some x-rays and, uh, and noticed that this was just a really bad placed sealant. And, um, and it really made me sad. Um, I will tell you that wholeheartedly, I took 100% responsibility for that sealant. Um, and now she actually ended up having to have a root canal on that tooth. And uh, I know that I'm the reason for the root canal. And, um, and, and I think that's when we have to tell ourselves, we know that we're not perfect. Um, we also know that there are things that we do sometimes um, being young in our career and just really we're only as good as the person that trained us. And so tonight, um, I really, really want to really just kind of dive into proper sealant placement that we just assume that our team, especially for the doctors and the hygienists tonight that are on here, but also the assistants that are on tonight, um, is to really look at your technique. And if you're not feeling good about the way that you're placing the sealant, um, really go back. You know, tonight is, is it's just been really an eye opener of how many people that feel that they do do a great job of placing sealants. But I can guarantee you that so many of these sealants, especially right now, even according to Gordon Christensen, and we're going to get to that a little bit later, says that, you know, a lot of the sealant failure was because we knew right away we were not in a good situation, but we kept going, right? And that's when we have to say, okay, we're going to stop right here um, because we know, we're no dummy. We know whether or not what we're doing is really good application. And, and I got to be honest with you. Um, I feel like as a dental assistant that, you know, I'm, I've never heard a doctor or even a hygienist, especially if a hygienist works with a dental assistant to say, let me watch you place that. Or I want to see you place that. I think we just assume that our team knows proper placement. And I can tell you that that is not the case. Um, and again, Gordon, Gordon Christensen right now, these numbers and these percentages are just getting higher and higher and higher of sealants that were placed many, many years ago. And we never really look at them. We're not replacing them when we see that they're chipped. Um, are we looking at I know, um, areas where there are concern? And we want to take you through tonight just some of the things, again, that I've learned firsthand um, and, and just diving into it. You know, we know that with sealants, and I hear this all the time, that it's mo one of the most critical things that we could do um, to help with, you know, again, long-term decay. As soon as we see these molars erupting, we should be placing a sealant, but we need to pray place it properly. And so tonight is really going to take you through that. And most importantly, making sure that the longevity of that sealant is something that we don't have to worry about, um, you know, someone like my daughter um, having to be the reason why they had to have endo. And like I said, I know that there's always lots of reasons, but I do take firsthand responsibility for that and my own daughter. And so now when we just assume that these team members, members are trained properly and they know exactly how to place it, a lot of times we got to make sure, do they understand how to place it properly? What are some of the products that we can utilize? And most importantly, the best ways under the circumstances. You know, and sometimes there are times when I've got young uh, young kids in my chair that we're placing a sealant on and we just can't do it. So am I just going to continuously try or are we going to back up a little bit and say, listen, I would much rather wait um, maybe another six months, a little bit more mature uh, than for me to try to wrestle and try to, you know, hog tie. I hate to say that these kids uh, when we've got saliva everywhere and there's no way to keep this area isolated. And so I want you to know that I'm giving you permission tonight to say, mom, we're going to take a knee here and we're going to wait another few months because when you place a sealant on top of a decayed area, we're in trouble. And that's exactly what I did to my daughter, Haley. I am a dental assistant. I have been for 34 years now. I will tell you that this is probably the most popular course other than Invisalign that I give. And I will tell you that, again, I think it all has to do with we just assume these elementary procedures, these elementary clinical procedures that we are providing for patients is done correctly. 
all the way down to even colonial polishing. And so tonight, what I want you to really think about are those methods. And again, I am not a Gordon Christensen. I just quote him a lot, um, but I know what is bad. And I also know what can I do better for that isolation and most importantly, utilizing the right armamentarium to make sure that we're delivering a good sound sealant that's going to sit there and live and last, right? And then when I say that, it's un, it's really important to make sure that we really consider these areas. And I'm going to help you tonight to be very efficient and give you some ideas of how we can place these properly. Uh, and most importantly, making sure your team gets the right training. Okay, that's the most important thing. But what are we going to go through? We're going to understand all the different methods of isolation. Okay, it's not just cotton rolls here. We cannot bond to areas where we've got just a pool of saliva. Really important. And again, Back in the day, we didn't have all of these things, but now we've got so many different things that we can utilize. And tonight I'm gonna to share with you a couple of ways that we can do that and even give you some ideas of some of these products that you can get for free. Um, also utilizing various types of equipment to remove bacteria. We gotta make sure that there's no bacteria. We wanna make sure there's no plaque down into the grooves before we just seal it. Um, and making sure that we know exactly how to place that sealant properly based upon two different types of materials, right? We're going to also understand that what is a failed sealant look like? Um, how does the team, every time we see a patient every six months, we should be really looking at these sealants. And sometimes we have to repair it. Sometimes we may have to redo it. And how do we do that? And, and again, tonight is not about us all being perfect. Because let me tell you, if we all think we're perfect, we're wrong. I can't tell you the mistakes that I even made today, right? but we're only as good as the person that trained us, right? And I have to give credit that this is important tonight. And I really commend you for really being on this webinar because there's so many things that we talk about with the KO group uh, and so many things that we talk about in dentistry, but it's when we get back to the basics is where we really need to think about the foundation of these young adults. And I have six kids. I want to make sure that they are set up and that you don't, you know, really feel as bad as I did about my daughter. So again, when we think about a dental sealant, there's lots of ways that we can do this. We do a lot of training now as this tonight. We also do a lot of hands-on training. We can do virtual training with hands-on. There's so many things that we can do now that we couldn't do before. Um, the other thing is we're going to talk a little bit about maybe some of the devices. I am not paid by anyone except for the KO group tonight. They really allowed me to do this webinar for you because I think they see the value of getting back to those basics. You know, we can't just always talk about whitening and lasers. We got to talk about everything else um, that goes with it. And so tonight we're going to talk about the isolation and what are some of the devices that you can utilize. Um, we're going to talk about the proper placement. Also, can we really see what's there? What do we do to really be able to see what is there? Um, and we're going to talk about curing lights, okay, tonight, because again, I can tell you some of the curing lights that I've seen in my time. And most importantly, how can we make sure that these sealants are properly cured? Because again, going back to if it's mush and we think that it's sealed and it's really not, um, sometimes that can go back to failed cures. So we're going to go through that and then some troubleshooting, which I think is important. Okay. So I always quote Gordon on this because he's the reason, again, once I was feeling like a dog uh, with my daughter, and then I saw this, uh, this piece that he had did uh, really came in the mail. And I was like, oh my gosh, now I don't feel so bad because he was talking about the, the proper placement and some of the sealant failures that were out there. Sealants are one of the most likely dental procedures to prematurely fail. And I thank him for that because I think that this is something that we all need to understand that we're not perfect. Even the dental materials we know, and we look back at how many products are released every year, over 800. And not all products are going to be as good as we thought. And so this is where the documentation, um, you know, the technique, a lot of times, maybe a lot of times we blame, and I'm here to stand up tonight and talk about manufacturers, because let me tell you, a lot of times the manufacturer gets the blame when it really wasn't the manufacturer. It was us, the clinician, not doing things the way that we were supposed to. We don't read directions. We, a lot of times, make things up, you know, not all of us read, but we'll look at photos, step-by-step -step photos, but we won't really read, and we need to do a better job, and thank you to Dr. Christensen for really making us aware. Let's talk a little bit about who is affected by caries. Again, getting back tonight to this rubber meets the road, 22% of all two- to four-year-olds have dental decay. Oh, my gosh, that is crazy numbers, and these are fresh numbers this year, 22%. Why is it? Well, we can't blame everything on COVID. We have to tell ourselves it's the diet, it's the sugar. We got a rise in cost of food. 
to eat the way we should, we're going to pay for it. And then a lot of us, we know we go to the grocery store. My gosh, I just went night before last and only bought enough food for two nights of dinner and spent $200. It really and truly plays a factor in what are we doing? The other thing is we got to go back to having conversations. I always, as a dental assistant, really push um, that on my hygienist to talk about what are our habits? What are some of the things that we're eating? What is the nutrition we are looked upon now just as much as we are the doctors. When we're having these conversations, we see erosion, enamel erosion because of what patients are, are eating and maybe biting in today. I had a patient, you know, this morning that sucks on lemons and she was there for whitening. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I knew right away when I looked at her teeth that that's, she was doing something. And I said to her, tell me a little bit about your diet before we talk about shade. Because one of the things I noticed is she had a lot of translucency. This is where we, again, have to have these conversations. And I know that that's not what tonight is about. But listen, we're no longer just sitting there. We have to really have those conversations with patients to really help them to know, how did I lose that enamel and what is going on? But the facts are 22% of these kids, two to four, um, have dental decay. 53%, 53% of five to eight-year-olds have decay. What can we do to stop that? We have to make these our, our, our families aware. We have to also make ourselves. I can't tell you how many family members that I have that have decay. Well, the first thing we got to ask is what are they, what are they, uh, you know, is self-inflicted, right? What are we watching what they eat? Are we looking at what they're drinking? And again, really being aware, 50% of permanent teeth, um, early teeth, again, thinking about this, who's affected, you know, only 18% of school age children in the U.S. have sealants. That's a crying shame less than 18%, we got to do something. You know, we have to make these, these patients aware. And most importantly, um, I can't tell you how many patients have coverage and have insurance and they don't utilize it. So this is where as a mom, when I'm going to my kid's school, uh, and yes, I do. Uh, I go there. I talk to moms. I was sitting just last week uh, with my daughter who has had swimming lessons and we were talking about, you know, I, I came to my scrub. She said, what do you do? And I said, I, I work in a practice. I'm a dental assistant. Oh my gosh, you know, and we just started having these conversations. And I said, you know, so much that we know now about insurance coverage, and I teach a lot of insurance coverage. And, and I can say, you know, it's so underutilized. We're not utilizing to the maximum benefit that patients can get. And so we really have to have these conversations, you know, with patients. And again, when we look at these numbers, they are rising. And so we got to be aware. We got to get back again to the basics, right? Based on a 15 year study, 68% of sealed teeth were caries free versus 17% of unsealed uh, control group, right? That's a high percentage when we think about it. Because again, tonight, we're not here just to poo-poo sealants. We really want to uplift the sealant. It's just this sealant application. But we know that it does good things when it's placed properly and it's there. And so that's what I want us to really celebrate tonight is more of that. Uh, and again, when we think about this, more than five Billion people suffer from tooth decay. Five billion. That's huge. When we think about posting social media and things on social media, we have to start thinking about that awareness factor. And again, a lot of times we're so focused on the aesthetics and we're not thinking about the basics. These patients got to have the basics first. And so again, tonight, and I'm preaching to the choir. I had to really think about this myself, listening to myself and telling myself, um, I got to be a better assistant. I got to do better with this, but I also have to think in thinking about the people that I'm training and which are mostly dental assistants and they're office trained. Please think about that. Who is in your practice um, that's placing these sealants? Because again, the people that are placing the sealants are usually not the dentists. They are a dental assistant. Probably 67% are dental assistants and most of them are office trained. And if we're not trained properly, this is what's going to happen. And again, it's not like we meant to do it. It's just the way we were trained. And so again, what I want to raise awareness tonight is, and taking this back to your practice, for those of you that are on tonight, I just applaud you so much. Take this webinar back and show your team. It's the little things that maybe we just didn't really think about, but children with caries are three times more likely to develop caries as an adult. And that is so true. Again, nearly 40,000 of children treated for early caries development have new caries lesions within six to 12 months. And I apologize for the typo, but six to 12 months. So let me back up and say that again, nearly 40% of children treated for early caries, okay, early children's caries, uh, develop new caries lesions 
within six to 12 months of the previous dental work. So one of the things that's really important is for us to know that if we've got a patient that falls through the cracks and they don't come in every six months and maybe we just weren't able to get them in, this is where we see those same kids, those same patients coming back with even more decay and especially now more than ever. So we really got to make sure these patients do not fall through the cracks. And tonight was probably more clinical people on this program, but I really want you to know that at the end of the day, you got to take this back to your team up front and say, listen, when a patient is scheduled for sealants and we know that they have decay, we got to make sure we don't lose them or they don't reschedule or we don't let them fall through the cracks that we get them back in. And again, that's what this is about tonight. Um, you know, when we think about where these are being sealed, of course, it's an anatomical location uh, with pits and fissures just after a tooth erupts. We got to be looking, you know, as soon as we see it popping through that tissue is when we're looking and we're like, oh, and sometimes we can't see all of the tooth. There's a lot of times where that tissue is still, you know, kind of just barely hanging on. We say, you know, we've, we've seen that with photos, but I will tell you, my doctor is not going to wait when we start to see those areas that we can't keep clean and it may not be fully erupted. I will tell you, there are times my doctor would say, hey, listen, um, and I love that about him. He'll say, listen, I don't want to wait. Let's let's go ahead and seal some of this and we can always go back. We'll repair it once it finishes erupting. Uh, and I'll share with you tonight some of the photos and some of the cases that my dentist has done. I, I just uh, I love the way that he has taught us to do proper sealant. And that's why I'm teaching this tonight. Children and adults can benefit from sealants, even adults. Now, I will tell you, I've got a lot and we're so blessed to have fluoride in the water and, and a lot of our young adults, you know, I'm 54, but when I'm seeing these 30 year olds coming in with no cavities and saying, oh my gosh, I just got my first sealant. Well, listen, hey, it's a good thing, right? It's preventative. Um, the first molars appear around age six. Team in the practice who are office trained and maybe don't really know this, we need to be training them what to look for around age six. And those second molars are gonna come through around age 12. Um, and then sealing these teeth as soon as they come in can really help them. And so you say, well, Shannon, why would your dentist go ahead and want you guys to seal it even if there's a little bit of tissue over that tooth? Well, because guess what? That's the area where a lot of times plaque and food is going to get caught. And at least if we can seal these areas as it starts to super erupt, then you can always, and we're going to go through that. How do we repair a sealant? How do we make sure we're doing a good job? And even adding to a sealant, you know, because that happens a lot. And I'm going to help you to be able to identify when we need to do that. Why are they so important? Again, speaking to the crier, brushing alone will not take care of it. We have to get down deep into the tooth. I will tell you, there's so many studies, and I did not really know this until we started seeing teeth where they would take real teeth and slice it. And now we were able to see how deep these pits and fissures really go. And again, to your team that doesn't know this, this is so important because when they see how deep this goes, we usually think, oh, it's not going to be this deep. But when we take these teeth and they're sliced in half, and we see how deep this is, it is shocking. And as a new assistant, I can tell you, nobody ever really showed me these photos. And so when we think about, you know, probing and looking at, you know, with an explorer, the occlusal surface, we just assume that that's where it stops, but it goes really deeper than that. And so we got to be careful with our, explorers and those things, which again, nobody really talked about a long time ago. And now we're really being careful about where we stick that explorer on these pits and fissures, because when we're touching it with an explorer and there's plaque there, guess what we do with our explorer? We're pushing it into those pits and fissures even further. So now what we're hearing is we really shouldn't be doing that anymore, right? We should be really, really careful with our instruments and poking things and pushing that plaque right down into a deep pit and fissure where we didn't really think about that before, okay? So want to make sure that we're really paying more attention. Uh, to seal that occlusal fissures that significantly contribute to frequent caries, uh, making sure that we really don't contribute to that progression either, right? And again, a lot of... Uh, the ADA, AAPD uh, support these, um, you know, support sealants, right? We need it. Um, when we think about this, and again, elementary here, you know, sealants should be placed into those pits and fissures of teeth, uh, really based on that patient's caries risk too. Sometimes they're not as deep, you know, when they first, you know, erupt, we might not see those grooves a lot of nationalities, believe it or not, and we know that, for any of you who've been in dentistry for a long time, 
based upon your ethnicity or e ethnicity, I apologize because I'm getting over COVID um, and being sick and nasaled. Um, a lot of times that ethnic, ethnic background has a lot to do with it. You know, some uh, different ethnic backgrounds will see a little bit more of those grooves, uh, the anatomy a little bit more, um, I guess, uh, magnified. So we really need to be paying attention to those things. And, and, and again, over time, that elapsed eruption of teeth. Sealant should be placed on surfaces judged to be high risk. We're not just going to slap a sealant on there, though. I don't want you to misunderstand me if something is coming through the surface. The dentist always will tell us what he would like for us to do. But I will say that we know, you know that, again, once it's starting to come through, it really has a risk, especially a high-risk patient. We got to be understanding that. And, and most importantly, we do a lot of saliva check in my practice um, with, uh, with just chesting saliva, even on these young adults. That pH can be really high. So something that we didn't really do before that now we're doing more of. Uh, sealant placement methods should include carefully cleaning those pits and fissures. And we're going to get into that in just a few minutes and removing any of that plaque that could be down into those pits. Um, and uh, and again, making sure that we're using a hydrophilic material or we're using something that's really recommended by the ADA and has that seal of approval uh, is very important. And there's a lot of practices. Tonight is a not one versus the other. I'll talk to you a little bit about what I do in my practice and what we're utilizing. But again, you know, there's a lot of studies behind both. Glass ionomer materials could be used uh, versus transition um, and, and traditional sealant materials. And we're going to go through both a little bit tonight. But when I talk about taking a tooth and slicing it, there's so many, there's so much data out there, but this is something that I think is very important for your team who maybe hasn't seen this before. And again, how deep these can go. You know, these pits and fissures can be deeper than they appear clinically always. They can be teardrop, they can be parallel for one another and they can be shallow. So it really, really and truly is something that again, we don't have microscopes. Yes, we can take x-rays, but this is where we really have to look at it. And most importantly, know that they are so much deeper than what we can see with the naked eye. Even with, even with the six power loop, uh, it's very important. But there's two types of sealants that we use in dentistry. We have what's called resin-based sealant. And then we also have glass ionomer. And there's a lot of pros and cons to both tonight. Uh, again, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of what we see, okay? But it really goes back to, I think, your environment, um, the training that you have, um, and uh, and most importantly, again, looking at what you feel works best in your hands. Because I can tell you tonight that you should be using a glass ionomer, uh, but if it doesn't feel good in your hands and it can't be properly pay placed or you don't feel good placing it, um, then, you know, it doesn't do any of us any good. It's better than placing nothing, right? But we got to be careful with how we feel and what we believe might be the best for our patients. And again, tonight's not for me to, to make that decision for you. I know that I use mostly resin base because I feel like it works best in my hands. I can properly place it, which you'll see tonight. Um, and to me, I do a really good job with it now, now. <laughs> but um, for me, I think the harder placement was the glass ionomer um, and a lot of people feel like that's the best way to do it. And I'm not here tonight to, to poo-poo that. Um, I just feel like it doesn't, I don't do the best job for our patients. And so for me now teaching this and believing in it and knowing what I've done and the failures that I've made, this to me is the best way and route for me. Um, so when we think about resin based, fully erupted tooth, you know, tooth can be isolated. We're going to talk about isolation a little bit. Um, where the glass eye armor partially erupted teeth, you know, again, going back to that partially erupted, you know, a lot of people feel like they can do that, uh, where isolation is a problem. A lot of people say, Shane, you know, I can't keep it isolated and I don't want to have to worry about saliva. So I'm always going to go to the glass eye armor. But I can tell you, I've seen a lot of clinicians, a lot of famous clinicians, a lot of video, a lot of things on YouTube. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's worse than the sealant that I put in Haley's mouth. So I, you know, they say, well, you know, I think they feel like because it releases fluoride that we're good to go. Um, but that is not true. So, you know, we actually can do that and we can cause patients to have to have fillings and decay that was already undermined that we didn't see. Um, so again, that proper placement is important. Uh, I feel like with resin base, we do see a superior uh, clinical retention. And that's one of the reasons why I use it. Um, but the chemical bonds to tooth when we're using a glass ionomer um, have that active fluoride release that we talked about. And there's a lot of studies. And again, the moisture, it's not moisture sensitive, right? We don't really have to worry about it as much. Um, but again, for me, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is to look at some of the videos on YouTube and make that decision yourself. Um, and uh, for me, I feel like just, we're just not, for me, I just, it doesn't work say, in my hands. So again, moisture sensitive. Yes, I got to be really careful. I'm going to use a lot of 
isolation devices. I'll use rubber dam. Yes, I am a rubber dam person. I do love it. Uh, I was taught very well uh, by Dr. Pop. So uh, if you're interested in doing better with your rubber dam, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, he is amazing. And I would encourage you and your team to take that, um, take some learning lessons from him or some, uh, some of his learning modules. Uh, but there's a lot of good, again, glass ionomers out there. I mean, you know, you've got Reva Protect from SDI. You have Fuji Triage, which is, if I was going to use it, that's going to be number one for me. Um, and then I would say there's also Ionosil from Voco. There's there's three really good ones out there. I, for me, it's just really what you feel more comfortable with. Um, if you think about resin base, for me, number one is Ultradent. It's the one I'm going to use probably 99.9% .9 of the time. I have used Clean Pro Sealant. It's nothing bad against that. Um, I know that Avaclar has one and so does Voco. There's many, many good ones out there. I just tend to, tend to lean, lean more towards the Ultradent because to me, they're kind of the gold standard and they're getting ready to come out with a brand new sealant um, as well. And there's going to be some good, good, um, uh, I think, evidence based upon uh, this product. But let's talk a little bit about the isolation because I promised you tonight that this is something I want to make really simple and easy for you. Again, we're you know, there's lots of ways to isolate um, a patient. And again, tonight is not so much about that. I do have my own rubber dam course because I love rubber dam. Um, but I will tell you that in our minds, we think we're doing a really good job with isolation and we're really not. Um, and again, I know a lot of us don't have a lot of money and I'm with you, you know, in my big practice, we have 25 ops, we got seven doctors and a lot of team. And there's a lot of things that we know with these equipment and materials that we're using, they do cost money. So I want to share with you a couple of different avenues of where you can go tonight uh, to be able to really, um, you know, uh, ha have a way to, to, to really control that isolation. Okay. Now, when we get to it, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody and just kind of have an idea here of everything that's going on. Okay, great. Just want to make sure there's no questions yet because I didn't want to not answer some questions. Um, the first thing is one of my favorites. This is a product called Relief. And you may have seen this when COVID was out. Uh, you know, a lot of people are using this. This is an amazing hygiene product. My hygienist like kissed me when I brought it in. Uh, I would tell you that it is a great uh, way. Uh, we also have an isolite. It's not to say anything bad about the isolite. Um, it's just that the isolite is is can be pricey, you know, and uh, and then it's just knowing that again, having so many hygienists in my practice, that this is a great way for us to have something that is disposable and that everybody can use and afford. One of the things about the relief is that it almost is like a dry angle. It basically is a device, which you'll see here in a minute. Um, and uh, you can just kind of hook it on the patient's mouth. It goes into the cheek uh, and it'll help with any type of air polishing. Um, and sealant placement. And I, I really do like it. What is also great about it is the patient can close on it and that little leaf is disposable. So it's one way uh, of isolation. The other thing is, is that I'm, I'm showing here just a little tabletop video. Um, if you are, and I'm not going to turn the volume up because I want to jump to it pretty quickly, but this is a product that not a lot of people know about. Now, I told you I'm a rubber dam queen. I love rubber dam, but for practices that say, Shannon, I am not placing a rubber dam and going through all of that because I hate it. It takes too long to place. This is called the mini dam and it's from DMG, the mini dam. And I will tell you, it's so easy. It's so fast to put on. You'll be like, oh my gosh, really? Uh, so let me just share with you really quickly how you do it. So as you are placing it, you'll see here, excuse me, I didn't mean to do that. Um, you'll see that you can just kind of grab it and stretch it and put it right over the patient. Let me just kind of jump to it really fast because I'm talking this whole time. Um, but uh, shoot, I thought I had it in here. Um, I apologize, but basically it's a little mini dam that fits over two teeth. You grab it, you stretch it, and it just pops down right through. And I apologize for some reason that's not showing up tonight. Um, and it's probably operator error, but, uh, but again, I don't quite see exactly where, um, I guess I already had it placed here, but, uh, but you'll be able to see, um, exactly what we need to do. And, uh, okay, there it goes. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I was wrong. So here I'm just kind of, you stretch it and you just kind of slide it down. Uh, over the two teeth and oh my gosh, it sees in like seconds because I know so many practices are like, no, we're not going to place a rubber dam. What is so great, I get this from DMG, it's called the mini dam, is that anybody can place this. Oh my gosh, my 10 year old could place this. Okay. Um, I absolutely love it. If you're at a practice where you're like, we're not going to go through the clamps, you don't have to anesthetize the patient. It it's really doesn't hurt to place it down. It just kind of, it's almost like you just floss right through the teeth. Um, and again, it really is a good isolation. If you are saying, Shannon, you know what, we're not going to go through all of that. This is a nice way to kind of isolate those areas and quickly place it. It took seconds. Okay. So uh, again, the mini dam, this is from DMG. You also can place a conventional dam. Okay. And, uh, and again, 
if we're doing four quadrants, this is what I'm doing, but I place rubber dam every day. So again, you got to go to the gurus. Uh, Dr. Ian Pop is probably the number one and you can email me at the end and I'll tell you how to go and get his course. He's amazing. You'll never see anybody in your life place a rubber dam like this guy. I mean, I just like, ooh, it's just like, it's amazing. So there's lots of great ways to do that. And again, tonight is not so much about the rubber dam placement, um, but a couple of things that you want to do right is making sure that we have good forceps. We're also always making sure that we uh, put our, 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 basically our, our clamps and, and really going through where we're hole punching, making sure we have the largest hole is always going to be for our anchor tooth. And then going forward, I always bring my rubber dam to the midline. Uh, and again, if you're interested in a course that we give, I'll be more than happy to do that on behalf of KO uh, for you, but, you know, having really good clamps and, 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 and again, I'm placing rubber dam. My doctor believes in it in great isolation. So we place it every day and we're very efficient with it. And this is where we train the assistant to place those. But if you said, I'm never going to do that, Shannon, then think about the mini dam or the relief. Both are good. But we go through different clamps, you know, and there's great ways to do this. We basically isolate that tooth uh, with, you know, we use a key guide to make sure we know exactly where to punch those holes. Yes, I'm old school when it comes to that. Um, and then I like to place my clamp on the tooth, make sure I've got the good clamp. And then I'm just going to stretch it over and then floss it through. Uh, and yes, we do. We do all four quadrants uh, and place them all. So this way things can be very isolated. Um, and again, it, it, it just depends on what you want to do in your practice. But if you really talk about proper placement technique, it does start with this and then use, utilizing that. And so I do think that this is a great way to do it. So now let's get into what you came for, the sealant placement, right? When we think about sealants, we're bonding these to the teeth. And this is the first area of where we're going to touch on tonight. Um, you know, again, we already know about that. We've already talked a little bit about, you know, making sure that we establish a tight seal. It has to be clean. If you are looking at it and there's plaque all over it, we need to do something. We need to use an air abrasion unit to get the plaque out of the way. That really is probably the number one way that Gordon Christensen really promotes and says, hey, use a, um, you know, use, you know, aluminum oxide or use uh, a product from Dent Supply. They have one that basically is an air abrasion unit to air braid uh, as deep as we possibly can get, right? Um, and, you know, a lot of people have used pumice. That's how I was trained is to use pumice. But now that we've got these air abrasion units that we're even using in hygiene now, why not utilize them? So something to really think about. We also want to make sure that we're, if we're using a resin sealant, that we are etching long enough. That's probably one of the most important pieces of this is etching long enough and then using a good curing light, which we know we have some crappy curing lights in these offices. Let me tell you, I can tell you that I, I've gone in to train people and I see this nasty curing light with like 10 layers of resin on it. It's never going to cure anything. we got to make sure we're using really good material. So here, when we think about this, you know, one of the things that's really important is, again, inadequate etching. We're not etching long enough. That's the first area. When we think about bonding and we acid etch a tooth that we're going to be bonding, we have to leave the etch on long enough. And this is where, again, we go back to not having um, uh, reading the manufacturer's instructions and most importantly, timer. Using a timer is the way to go. The dentist in my practice, Dr. Corman, everything sets by a timer because if we don't, everything in dentistry takes forever. So we got to have a timer. We also want to make sure that we're using something that's going to seal and have a very high bond strength, right? With the resins, we know that we, um, you know, we can have that glass ionomer sealant, which is fine. But, you know, again, going back to that retention, we know with resins, we have some good clinical um, data on it. You know, 58.8% of complete retention after one year. Um, and then it's getting higher. Now with some of the hydrophobic sealants like UltraSeal Hydro, and then they have a new one coming out, we're seeing that rise to about 61.8% uh, and higher. So again, these numbers are rising, uh, which I'm glad to see. But if you don't have an air abrasion unit. This is a great little brush. It's actually called the star brush. Uh, and I'm going to use con concepsis. And again, I apologize. That's that's misspelled. It's concepsis scrub. Why? Because it has chlorhexidine and it. it's going to kill any bacteria. Or the best way is to use your air polisher and to air braid your micro etcher and, and use a micro etcher and get any plaque, just things that we can't really see. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to just kind of clean that off, right? Clean everything off and then jump right to it. Um, but the next thing that I want to talk about is proper curing, because if we don't have a really good curing light and we're utilizing some of these dinosaurs that really should be in the Smithsonian, and we all got dinosaurs, right? We think these things last forever. They do not. 
Now, I can tell you that when the KO group first showed me and really introduced me to the Monet, um, I said to myself, I don't think that's going to work. There's no way a one second cure is going to work. And, and, and I'm being brutally honest. Um, and I will tell you that I was like, okay, let me see this. I got to test it. Um, I feel that this is probably one of the areas and even not me, I'm going to just kind of give you a little bit of statistics tonight. Even Gordon Christensen, again, going back to what he says is when we think about resins being uncured, this is, again, we're talking about uh, a sealant that is a resin. It is not cured. And if we are not testing our, our, um, our curing lights and making sure that when we're using an LED curing light that we are testing it, um, I can tell you how many studies that are out there right now where these these cure lights are just horrible. And most practices are always trying to get a good deal. And I see them buying them on. Uh, I, had a, I had just not even last week. I couldn't even uh, I just couldn't even believe that this practice was buying these cure lights off of Amazon. And listen, I know these cure lights are an investment. But let me just tell you, at the end of the day. Um, you're only as good as what you place in that patient's mouth. And we're responsible for that. And so, you know, oh, Shane, I found this cure light for $67. Is this good? And I was like, I can't believe you're even asking me this. You know, again, we have to invest in really good equipment. And uh, for something that for me in my practice that I can cure in one second, there is no doubt. I'm always looking at how I can be more efficient, but this is a true laser curing light. Okay. There's nothing like this on the market. It's the one and only. Not only do we feel good when we know we are curing something, we know uh, that it is properly cured. And I will tell you, you can't really make a mistake with one second cure, right? You hit the button and yes, it does what it says it does. And so here, when you think about laser curing, there's so many advantages to this. Uh, and that's not me, again, going back to Gordon Christensen, that we don't really have to worry about that, right? And so that's what I want you to really think about. When we think about using LEDs, a lot of the, uh, statistics and the numbers we're seeing is because, first of all, we're not using it like we should. We don't really trust it. Uh, and most importantly, we're not really making sure that we're using an, uh, a, a device in order to make sure that it is as high as it should be. This is a laser. We don't have to worry about it. I want the assurance of knowing that this is cured material, no matter what we're doing, whether it's a sealant, composite. There are times that we've been out of sealant material. Yes, we have a big practice and we were out. We go to a composite. My doctor, there's no way we don't treat them any different than we do uh, our composites in our practice. And so that's why I want you to really think about it. If you have not seen the Monet, first of all, it's gorgeous. Um, second of all, one second cure. I mean, we use it for everything. So again, want to make sure it's faster. And uh, again, Gordon thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread. And that's the person that I want to go to, because this is, again, when we talk about failure and placement, this is the same thing. So placing that sealant, we're going to acid edge for however long the manufacturer says we need to, placing the edge 30 seconds on uncut enamel. Again, after we even go through our air abrasion, 15 seconds on cut enamel. Sometimes my doctor is really worried. And he will get in there with a little fissure burr and open up those fissures uh, to open up those areas to make sure because he's like, Shane, if I can't see it, I'm gonna open it up. Hey, listen, I'm okay with that. I love it. Can I tell you, if that were your kids, you do the same. You know, if you can't see it and you get in there as a hygienist, as an assistant, if I go in there and I say, hey, listen, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Spool, but listen, I, I I almost feel like you got to get in there and open it up for me. Don't be scared to tell the doctor that. I mean it. Hey, listen, I can't get in there deep enough. I don't feel comfortable. I don't think that's going to get in deep. I think I need you to come in and open it up for me. Um, do that. Listen, I want you, I'm giving you permission tonight to feel that you can go and talk to the doctor. Don't just slap some sealant on something that you don't feel good about. Go with your, always go with your gut, okay? Uh, so when we rinse that off, we're going to make sure it's frosty. It has to be like snow on the ground. If it's not, we didn't etch long enough. And sometimes I will etch long enough, but it didn't look good to me. If it looked funny to you, again, trust in your instincts. It's when we move forward and we don't really go with what we see. If it doesn't look good, and I even think to myself, if this were my kid, is that good enough? No, I'll go back and I'll re-etch, re-etch it. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to express the ultra seal. And this is what I'm using in my practice. I like the ultra seal hydro. Now I'm going to tell you that um, I will always make sure that when I squeeze it out first, I don't squeeze it out and try it while it's on the tooth. I'm going to squeeze it out on a two by two. This is where we get into trouble. We don't train our team to extrude things out before we put the tip on, no matter what they say. I don't still trust it. I want to squeeze it out and make sure I got the plunger. I also want to squeeze it out with the tip on and I want to see how fast it's going to come out. There's lots of other ones out there. This is not about Ultradent, but I'm going to tell you that there's a lot of sealants that come out so fast 
and they also will come out with bubbles. So please, please, please pay attention to that. Now, the one thing that I like is a brush end so I can brush it. I don't take a sealant uh, or, or take an explorer, excuse me, and go through. I want a brush that I can brush it and brush it away and make sure that I'm getting all those areas, all those pits and fissures really covered. But I don't want a bunch of material like with Haley where it's just like, squeeze it out. And then I'm going to go right to my Monet. You can trust it because it's a laser. It's the only one on the market for one second. Boop, you're like, Shannon, really? I've had, it was funny when I first got it, my doctor looked at me when I said, boop. And he said, go ahead and hit it again. I'm like, no, that's all we need. No, go ahead and hit it again. No, that's all we need. It's only one second. It's a laser, okay? And so it's pretty funny to see his face, but I will tell you that it will be cured. And that depth of cure is something we don't have to worry about. Then when we look at it, this is really what we want to think about. You know, we need to reapply it if it is lost. Do you know what I'll do is I'll actually take my Monet and shine it in the patient's mouth. That's going to be a second. So you got to pay attention. But listen, the one thing that I love about a lot of sealants out there, and it's not just ultradents, is you can see it when you shine the light in there. So now what we've done is every six months, even in hygiene, we will take the Monet and it's in every single room and it's getting ready to be even more. We will take the Monet and highlight it, shine it in the patient's mouth really quickly to check and see, are those sealants still intact? And this is something that is so amazing about the Monet. A lot of practices have to use like little lights to go get a flashlight. We don't have to do that. We've got the Monet. We can just shine it right in there every six months to check every tooth where those sealants were to make sure that they're intact. And if they're not, we're going to go back and we're going to replace it or we're going to add to it. Or sometimes my doctor will come in and say, that's a horrible sealant and I don't trust it. And I'm going to open it up. All right, go ahead. I love that. I'm going to tell you that to me is the person I want to work for. Um, we'll roughen it with a micro etcher, um, re-etch it for 20 seconds and reapply that sealant. If you place a sealant and you're not happy with it, or you feel like maybe you didn't extend it as far out as you need to. And don't forget the buckle pit. I see this all the time. The patient doesn't have any cavities on the occlusal surface, but they never put the sealant in the buckle pit. It's the craziest thing. I wish I, I have a, I should have put it in this presentation. I got a patient where they have a beautiful sealant and they didn't put it in the buckle pit. I'm like, what in the world? What were they thinking? It's important. Again, uh, you can use pumice. I will say that, you know, that's, you know, again, a lot of people use pumice. I'm not here to say anything bad about it. Uh, I will tell you that I use my airflow from, uh, uh, I, I love, you know, using that from Hugh Freddy. There's a lot of different instruments out there. It's not about that, but I do like whether a micro etcher um, and pumice is good too. Again, using a good uh, brush. I do like a brush in on my polisher and I like pumice preppies because there's nothing in it. It's just pumice. Uh, they do come in these little cups, which is nice. But again, if you can use an air polisher, it makes sense, right? We're gonna we're already using it in hygiene. Why not just air polish or micro etch those areas and make sure the plaque is not in there? Let's look at what they look like. This is here when you think about to the upper right, that is a pool of sealant. Do you know whose tooth that is? That's my daughter's. And guess what was underneath there? There was decay. So I want to make sure that I am really acid etching the way we should, cleaning out those grooves, um, acid etching long enough. Uh, I also want to make sure that when we rinse it out, if I'm using any type of glute or aldehyde, HEMA for two one minute applications, we just want to suction that off really good. We don't want to rinse it, okay, because it's going to kill the bacteria. Uh, also, placing a bonding agent. If you're going to do bonding, you know, lightly blowing that. But I will say that, you know, why why use your bonding agents and your flowables if you don't have to, if you've got a really good sealant that you can utilize? Um, but again, I want you to really look at the placement, you know, again, when you see a large area like this, that's kind of pull or a big, I would say almost like a swimming pool of sealant, be leery of that. You know, sometimes we don't see the decay until it's too late. So this is where I really want you to make sure that you're extruding some out on your tabletop and then training your team to kind of go in those areas. You know, when you look at it here, um, again, it's a lot and this is, you know, not good. So please be more aware of it, you know? And again, we don't wanna wait till it's too late and we've got an MOD, right? Or a big uh, occlusal uh, place where we were the ones that placed that sealant many years ago and now all of a sudden it's turned into a restoration. We gotta make sure that our team understands that when they slice this, these pits and fissures are very, very deep. And so don't just assume as a new assistant and even as an older aged assistant, I didn't realize how deep those pits and fissures could go until 
took a course on it. I was like, wow, that's an eye opener to see that tooth sliced in half and see how deep that can go. There's no way on God's green earth that we're going to get that, that material cured properly with our LED light. It isn't going to happen. And we don't want to make sure that we don't uh, get down deep enough with the sealant material, which is why I like to have a little brush and get in there with it. But they go hand in hand. And so I can't say enough a night tonight about that. You know, go back and look at what you're doing. If you're, uh, again, having these, these little courses like this, I just give KO the kudos for allowing me to talk about other things because I feel like, you know, when we think about Corona polishing, are we polishing correctly? Are we doing, use, utilizing the right polishing pace? Are we polishing the way we should? Don't just assume your team knows how to do that. And in new team members, regardless if they just got out of school or not, watch them. Are you really looking at how they're placing it? Are we watching them? Do you ever come in when they're placing a sealant, something so elementary that you would think everybody knows how to do it? They don't. And so I really appreciate you tonight because these numbers when it comes to sealant are very high tonight on this webinar. And I thank you for that. I thank you for really looking at yourself and reevaluating. We're not perfect. I've been in dentistry 34 years. I am not perfect. But when it's your own family, that's when you have to start saying, man, no, I need to go back. You know, I'm learning more now about uh, all different types of equipment, proper curing times. Uh, you know, I don't have to worry about that anymore because now I have the Monet. It's one second. Um, but these little bitty things that you have to go back and reevaluate the isolation. If you want information on how to place rubber dam, try the mini dam, you know, utilizing, maybe you can't afford to isolate, which is a great, great piece of equipment, but every op in my practice can't have it. So, you know, the relief is a good, you know, second to that. So that's what I want you to really think about tonight. Let's answer just a few of your questions, because one of the things that I think is great is you being here and again, having the statistics uh, we dive a lot deeper in this. We also are going to be offering some of the courses where we actually will send the models to you with KO's partnership. We send the models to you and you actually learn how to play sealant. And you say, Shannon, it's so elementary, but we can do it over a lunch and learn. Uh, but we have models now and we're doing this a lot. We call it CE in a box. We have to ship you the models to your practice. Um, you and your team or your team practices placing them uh, and utilizing the Monet to see how fast that can cure if you don't have one in your office. Um, but really doing more hands-on with your team. It's not always about us, hey, where are we for the month? Um, when you invest in me, I'm going to do a good job. Um, and most importantly, I'm going to remember that you invested in me as far as a team goes. And so don't just assume we're only good. And hygienists, if you have a hygiene assistant, watch them, you know, see what they're doing. Again, my hygienists are responsible for the hygiene assistant that works with them and making sure they're doing this right. Don't just assume because they went to school for it that that person trained them correctly. Uh, if that was the case, my daughter would not need a root canal, okay? So I am telling you firsthand and being very vulnerable with you to let you know that we need to get back to that. And so I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, and most importantly, just making sure that we have everything for you. I thank you so much again to, to the KO for doing this. And if you have not tried the Monet, you really need to look at it. I can't tell you how many cure lights uh, that we had in the practice that I know um, that, you know, are not doing a good job for us. And it's an amazing cure and light. And, and thinking about which way works better in your hands as far as sealant materials go. It wasn't to poo-poo the ionomers. You know, there's some really good ones out there. And again, but for me, when I would see just some of the placement and taking some of the sealant courses, I wasn't really happy with watching the clinician place that material. And that kind of was a red flag for me. When I'm watching someone take a cotton swab and kind of push it into the pits and fissures, to me, I was like, okay, I want something that flows that I know I'm covering every little area uh, and then shining my Monet in there to make sure that I did cover it. And that's a plus, I think. So just kind of thinking about that, um, again, is important. This is the way tonight that you're going to get your CE. You're going to take out your, uh, your phone and scan it. And the other thing is, is we're going to take this video and we're going to place it on the site. So if your team wanted to utilize this during lunch or maybe just spending 10 minutes as a refresher of how to place sealants is always good. And they can even do this. If you didn't have a patient, assign your team. That's what I do. I make my team go. Matter of fact, I'm not going to be in tomorrow. So I'm, I am I mean, my team actually, they're going to log in tomorrow and watch a, a webinar on uh, on some of the software that we have. I think that's something to think about. You know, when we don't have patients, what do you want them to do? Teach them to be better clinicians. Uh, it's important, right? So again, thank you so much to all of you guys. Tonight, this is my email address. Um, if you have any questions for me, you want some of that uh, extended version of this sealant course, because we only can spend so much time together tonight, uh, please let me know. Reach out to me. And again, going back, um, I have a lot of 
research a lot of, of different you know uh, components of this and if you have any questions about some of the materials that we use just know that um, I'm here for you and uh, I hope to see you again and our next one is going to be on whitening and it's my favorite thing to do I do a lot of it uh, and I want to help you with marketing because we've got a lot of holidays coming and if you're not marketing whitening something is wrong with you because we're going to be missing out if we are not going to be offering certificates for gifts, we're going into Thanksgiving season and then guess what happens? Christmas. Don't wait till December to do that gift giving. Start doing it now. I just made some new certificates myself and that's what we're gonna be talking about the next time I see you is marketing for your whitening and most importantly, getting patients to buy these certificates so you can do more in your practice because we're now getting into Christmas. We gotta be thinking about that. So again, I thank you so much for your time tonight. I hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Thank you to KO again for having me and I uh, look forward to seeing you on our next uh, webinar together. Have a, have a great night.